Well, good evening, everybody. Let's turn our Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 8, one of the longest chapters in the Bible, 66 verses. So this is part three. Uh, it was great to take a break last Wednesday so that we could just pray and do some directive prayer, and uh, we'll be doing that again in July, in the third Wednesday uh, of July. By that time, maybe we'll all be here in, in the sanctuary, and we can all pray together uh, in person, but until that time, um, God is good to us, as Matt said. So, First Kings chapter eight, verse fifty-four is where we left off. And make sure you're preparing yourself for communion. So we'll take communion at the end of the Bible study. But let's ask God to bless our study, Father. In Jesus' name, we come before you because we can. We're your children. And you love us, and we love you. And as we'll see here today, that you love when we call upon your name. You love when we are just totally desperate for you, God. As many of us, no doubt, have been panting after the water brooks this day or this week. And now we come, Lord, and we humble ourselves before you, and we ask that you would speak to us through your word, that you would give us the the application, God, that we can um, learn from you, Lord, and, and take what we have learned tonight, what we will learn, and put it into practice, put it into action. So, Father, speak to us, we ask, in Jesus' precious name. And everybody said, amen. Well, this evening, we pick it up in verse 54, where Solomon is in the midst, or has been praying, and he's going to close his prayer. It's going to be his first closing. No. He's going to be closing in prayer. And he stays there in verse 54. And so it was, when Solomon had finished praying, all this prayer. What a great prayer. Uh, Go back and review, if you have time, uh, after this, this study. But it was a great prayer. Prayer and supplication um, to the Lord that he arose from before the altar of the Lord. Notice, from kneeling on his knees with his hands spread up to heaven. Solomon began this prayer, if you remember, on his feet. But he couldn't stand. He, He couldn't stay on his feet. Eventually, he fell to his knees, guys, in reverence and in worship of God. You could just imagine the scene. Just imagine the atmosphere there. The the temple behind them, the people in front of him, this beautiful structure. um, And there are the people, and he's just praying for them. So he begins by lifting his hands, and he ends on his knees. That's always good, right? We all begin on our feet But eventually we find ourselves on our knees, hey, even on our face sometimes, don't we? Just worshiping God, thanking God. And so this he does. In reverence and worship to God, he is now on his knees, and now he arises up. He comes up from the altar, his hands spread to heaven. And as we said last time, his hands in that posture His hands, as is lifted up to heaven, remember, it's as if he anticipated God uh, receiving from the Lord the supplication of of God to the people. He's, he's by faith, he's saying, Lord, I know, Lord, that your will will be done. And as I pray for these people, I'm praising you, I'm lifting my hands up to you, but in a sense, he's saying, I'm I know that you're going to answer the prayer in your precious will. It's as if I'm anticipating, Lord, the movement of you, God, the movement of God upon these people. Just a wonderful, wonderful thing going on here. And so we know that when we go to prayer and God, he he wants us to pray, as I said in my own prayer, He, he looks forward to us. Communicating, and that's what prayer is. Prayer is communicating with God, our maker. Friends, listen, we we must not take prayer lightly. We are privileged as believers 
to have communication with God. We are privileged, this side of the cross, to go to his throne room boldly to pray with him. Paul says, pray always. And I know many of us do as we're driving. We're just, it's communicating with God. It's, it's worshiping the Lord. And, and this is what we do. And we know when we go to prayer that we will never leave empty. We will never leave empty. One way or the other, God is going to, well, we know that uh, he, he wants us to pray and we'll never leave him. We leave by faith, knowing that he has heard our prayer, that he continually hears our prayer as we cry out to him. And we know that we will never leave empty. And you need to know that as well. You need to know the importance of prayer. Communicating with the maker, our maker, God. Jesus, while on earth, if you remember his life, and he prayed. Jesus, we see him there in his ministry. There, those last three and a half years, if you would say, of his life. He prayed while he was on the earth. Why? Because he knew that it was important to pray. Not only did he pray for himself, but he prayed also modeling. Here we go again from Sunday morning's message. Modeling to, for his apostles, his disciples, that important aspect of having a relationship with God and praying. He, he, he is modeling for them. Now, you may have heard of that acronym for prayer, ACTS, A-C-T-S. It stands for adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. And there are other acronyms uh, for prayer. And I think if that helps you, that's great. ACTS, A-C-T-S. Adoration, worshiping God, confession. Hey, when we worship God, are we not broken? When we worship God, does he not open us up? When we worship God, is there not a sense of just humility and humbleness and brokenness before God? And then there's, there's thanksgiving, thanking God. And then there's supplication, that's the S. Not only for, our, for ourselves, but for others. If that helps you, then, then use that X. Either way, just pray, right? Just pray, man. Just communicate with God how you speak to him and, and, and know that he hears you, that he hears you. Yes, Jesus not only prayed, he taught us how to pray. When you look at Matthew 6, that wonderful chapter, in Matthew 6, 5, and 8, just as Jesus' words, now watch this, he says, and when you pray, not if you pray. Underline when, not if. See, he expects you to pray. He expects us to pray. He expected his disciples and his uh, apostles to pray. When you pray, number one, he says, you shall not be like the hypocrites. Why? For they love to pray standing in the synagogues, and on the corners of the street that they may be seen by men. See, when they prayed back in the day, when the Pharisees prayed, when the religious peoples prayed, as Jesus called them hypocrites, they began on their feet and they stood on their feet. There was no brokenness. There was no falling to their knees. There was, there was no really truly contrite heart there. Their prayers were loud, and there's that parable in the, in the scriptures where Jesus talks about the Pharisee and the, and the Republican, or the Demo, or Republican, something like that. You know that. You know that prayer. The prideful man goes in and says, I'm glad, Lord, that I'm not like this, this sinner next to me, you know. And the, and the publican who was a tax collector says, Lord, forgive me, man. Forgive me. My words are few. And we see the difference between those two. So he says, not if, but when you pray, don't pray like a hypocrite. Don't pray to be seen by men. Because the results of that kind of heart, where he tells us, assuredly I say to you, they have their what? They have their reward. They just got their reward. Everybody's looking at them. Ooh, wow. Ooh, ah. I remember when I was just a young Christian, we were going to Sunlight Christian Center in Orange, uh, in California. That's where... Me and my wife got our, 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 our foundation. 
Pastor Joe would teach the, the, the Bible. He would teach all the, 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 the men and women of the Bible. We went through with him, you know, for five years. But I remember when we were there and I would go to prayer meetings, there was this man who used to pray in King James. I loved it. You know, I, I just thought, wow. That, you know, and, and I wasn't judging his heart or anything. I just thought, wow, that guy, man, that now that guy can pray. And I, I really felt that he sincerely prayed to God and he, he loved the Lord, but that's the way he was raised, to pray in King James. And, and so uh, however you pray, whatever you say, make sure it comes from your heart. Make sure you're not looking for people to look at you, to bring attention to ourselves. Somebody said, prayers spoken to be seen of men will only get the response of men, but never the response of God. God says, you just got your reward. You'll get the response of men, but never the response of God. He says in verse 6 of Matthew 6, but you, speaking to us now, disciples of Christ, but you, when you pray, again, not if, (laughs) but when you pray, Go into your room. This is cool, man. Wait, wait. And when you have shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place. And your father who sees in the secret will reward you openly. And, of course, Jesus is, is here. You know, he's, he's using this illustration to show, really, that um, this, this private place, this this really the closet, as the King Jimmy would say. It really, he's speaking uh, of your heart's attitude. And, 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 you know, more than a posture, we said last week, of, of, of standing or kneeling or on your face, but in your heart. You see, this is what's cool about what Jesus said. That word for room, circle it in your Bible. Well, that word for room speaks uh, of a... Um, well, it speaks of a storeroom. The word is um, tamayon, tamayon. And it speaks of a storeroom. Listen, it's an ancient word that speaks of a storeroom where treasures were kept. It speaks of a storeroom where treasures is kept. Here he says that when you go into this private place where no man can be impressed or imposed upon to answer our prayer, Because that can happen too. Oh, Lord, I need four tires, God. Oh, if someone would just, Lord God, if you just put it on somebody's heart to give me four tires, God, then then, then I know you answered it. Well, what are you feeling? You're feeling guilt, right? No, this is a room that speaks of a private place where no man can be impressed and no man can be imposed upon to answer our prayer. But that room does mean a storeroom where treasures were kept. And what's interesting is Jesus would say, remember later on, for where your treasure is, what? There your heart will be also. So, so our prayer from our heart is what really ma- matters. Whether it's in an actual prayer closet, and I know someone who has one, <laughs> a married to her, but, or also uh, just... Speaking publicly, and that's not prohibited. God is not prohibiting speaking publicly. So don't get it twisted. I've had people say, you know, we shouldn't have prayer meetings. Everybody, no, no. He's not prohibiting that. Just, again, read the scriptures. But it's from our heart to God alone. It's from that, that, the, that shows where our treasure truly is. It's from our heart to God alone and not towards man. Now, we've been in prayer meetings before, and, and God bless the younger, the, 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 you know, the younger believers, they come in, they're excited, yeah, you know, and, uh, and you know, it's just, they, they catch you on fire again because they're just motivated and just want to pray and, you know, and, 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 and things like that, and you see the innocence of that treasured heart, that quiet place, that storeroom, that closet, the heart where God dwells. And that's where it truly matters, isn't it? It's our heart. He says in verse 7, And when you pray, not if, (laughs) do not use vain repetitions. That means to babble on. Uh, He says, as the heathen do. 
Now, Jesus, he's just breaking prayer down for us here, and it's so good I, I, to do a really in-depth study. We don't have the time, but he points to those who are of non-believers, the heathen, the Greeks, and even among his own people at this time. As we said, the Pharisees, the, the hypocrites. But he says, as the heathen do, and he says this, for they think that they will be heard for many words. And let me just say one thing, though. This does not speak of continuing and requesting and praying for unanswered prayer. This does not mean that we cannot repeat our requests to God as we pray for loved ones, as we pray for our spouses, as we pray for our prodigals, as we pray for our neighbors, as we pray for those who are not walking with the Lord, and we pray for for their salvation. It doesn't mean you can't keep praying for them. That doesn't mean that. As I said, that word means to babble on. To ba- babble on. To, to, to babble. It means just to, just, you're saying these things by rote. You're just saying these things over and over again. There's no heart in it. There's no passion in it. They're just trying to get through it. They're just trying to get through something. There's no relationship. There's no communion with God. It's just a constant, just these words that's, that's what he's speaking here. He says in verse 8, therefore, do not be like them. He's, he's, he's very clear here, Jesus. Don't be like them. Because here's the key, guys. For your father, personal relationship, knows the things you have need of before you ask him. And he wants us to ask him. He wants us. It humbles us, as I said. And it shows us he is the Lord in heaven and we are the children on earth in need. He, he wants us to ask him. Another thing when I read this and I've experienced this with other brothers in prayer meetings is that I don't pray because God already knows what I need. So he'll, again, they get it twisted. That's prideful. I don't, okay, if you're a quiet person and you don't want to pray, that's one thing. In a prayer meeting, no one's forcing anyone to pray out loud. God knows your heart. You may be praying internally with him, you know. But when you start saying, I don't need to pray if God already knows my needs, that's not, that's prideful. Because God wants us as a father. He wants us to ask of him. And remember, prayer is not changing God's mind. It's it's really changing our mind. It's getting us in the right alignment with his will. Because sometimes we pray especially in the supplication uh, uh, area where we're, praying, we're not praying right. Uh, we tend to pray for wants. We tend to, to pray for things that God knows, son, daughter, uh, these things will not be good for you. I am going to lead you to my will, which is better, and so on and so forth. Your father knows the relationship, the things you have need before you ask him. If you had a relationship with someone, especially your father, your parent, your mother, you talk to them, you speak to them, you request of them. And he's our heavenly father. And again, he's waiting to hear us, to pray. He's waiting for us to speak and communicate with him. And this Solomon did. And he prayed. He prayed for the people. He prayed with knees bent and hands open. But more importantly, again, He prayed with the right posture of heart. His heart was right with God. Moving on in verse uh, 55, he says this, Then he stood and blessed all the assembly of Israel with a loud voice saying, Blessed be the Lord who has given, number one, rest to his people, Israel, according to all that he promised. And so as he is giving this blessing to the assembly, he begins in the supplication, if you would, unto the Lord for the people. He asks God to bless him. And then in this blessing, he reminds the people that it is this God who is giving them rest. That word means peace. Peace. Who has given peace to his people Israel. Rest. He says, according to all that he promised. You see, as we stated before, the building of this temple is in Israel 
they were at rest from all of her enemies. They were just at rest. They were at peace. Something that re- they really hadn't um, experienced, especially the, the newer generation, had never, ex- or the older generation, have not experienced peace, have not experienced rest. Isn't it a joyful thing when you're just at rest? That, 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 you know, sometimes we call it a, a retreat. We retreat in order to what? In order to advance. But they, it's at a retreat where you just get away. You get away from everything. And you just rest in the Lord. Well, here they never experienced, and it was at this time that they, they experienced this peace, and they were able to build the temple of God. They were able to enjoy the times that they were in. We who are of the Lord also have been given this peace or this rest from God, and that is in our relationship uh, th- with his son Jesus. As, as Jesus said in John 14, 27, I'll read it in the NLT. He says, I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. Speaking of the soul, speaking of that peace internally. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. I want to say that again. And the peace I give is a gift that the world cannot give. It's that deep-seated peace, the peace of mind, the peace of, you're only going to get that peace with a relationship with Jesus Christ, guys. It's sweet when we have peace in the world, but when was the last time we really had peace? Oh, there's peace in our country, this wonderful country that we have. We, 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 we've experienced peace. Yes, there's chaos going on and, you know, and, and craziness going on right now, and and we're all kind of, uh, you know, in that place of just uh, uh, broken and weeping for the people and, and things like that. But, but there's never really been just straight out peace that Israel is experiencing right now. There's always a skirmish. There's always a war. There's always a need for, for armed forces. One day, we're going to turn our, our weapons into what? Plows, right? We're going to, you know, we're, one day, man. One day in that millennial period, man, there's not going to be a need for weaponry. There's not going to be a need for those who need to know how to fight and how to win wars. There's not going to be a need for that. But it's interesting that Jesus here says, I'm going to give you that peace. It's going to be a gift, and the world cannot give. He goes on to say, for they shall be called, excuse me, he says, so don't be troubled or afraid. And I think that, that I'm not only speaking to someone tonight, but I'm thinking speaking to all of us tonight. It's a word for all of us. Don't be troubled. Don't be afraid. We have the peace, the peace of mind, the peace of heart, the peace in our soul. And don't forget Jesus also said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. What is he saying there? What am I trying to say? What am I trying to put together in this Bible study? That we should be willing to sacrifice time and agenda to bring that peace of Christ to others. Especially in a situation of unrest. To bring that peace to others. God being the ultimate peacemaker, we as his sons and daughters follow and imitate his actions and he expects that of us to be peacemakers peacemakers not uh, unrest makers not war makers but peacemakers he goes on and and that to say there has not he says in 850 uh 56, in the middle there. There has not failed one, notice, of all his good promise, which he promised through his servant Moses. This is true. Uh, Solomon, who is this time uh, reading the scriptures, he has at least the first five books of Moses by his side, at his ready. And he knows, no doubt, from the things his father David had taught him, 
and what promises that God has given. And here he sees that not one, and I want you to know this, not one word of all his good promise has failed. That's another underliner, man. That was true at Solomon's time, and guys, listen, it's true for us today. Jesus would say in Matthew 24, heaven and earth will pass away, but my what? My words will by no means pass away. They're going to come to pass. And he said it in that wonderful chapter, Matthew 24, where he spoke of the, of the yet future, of the things, of the signs of the times and, and what was to come. His word will by no means pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away. But his word will always be, always be there. The faithfulness of God is something that we need to remember when we deal with the difficulties in life and the blessings as well. You know, when we're in that blessed time, and really it's always a blessed time because we are his children, but you know what I mean. When we're in the good times, we let's face it, sometimes we, we tend to forget to thank God for that and tend to forget to see God in it. And sometimes it's those difficult times where we say, oh, God, help me, you know? And we're all like that because we're flesh. But it's both in the difficult times of life and the, and the blessings as well that we know that God is faithful and his word will always come to pass. And, and, and like Solomon here is experiencing in our text. Verse 57, he says, May the Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. May he not leave us nor forsake us. Again, he's, he's blessing the assembly. He's speaking forth truth. And he's speaking of God's attributes, who God is, who God is to man, who God is to us. And here he speaks of the, 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 the God who will never forsake us. Um, Again, a promised relationship with God is a sealed relationship through his son, Jesus, for us. God never left Israel. I mean, he even gave them the pillar and the cloud as a sign of his presence when they were traveling through the desert to show that I am with you. I'll give you this sign. I'll I'll give you this this cloud to keep you cool in the day and and this pillar of fire, you know, to give you light at night. I will show myself that I'm always with you. And now they have the temple. Now, Now they don't have this tent, this temporary dwelling place. Now they have the temple, you see. And the temple gives forth. It's, it's, again, another sign of his presence. It's a place where they can pray. It's a place where God said, I will make myself known through the Shekinah glory once a year. That you can turn to this temple and you can pray toward that, that I will never leave you. Yet, why are we so prone to wonder? I told you last Sunday that Israel is God's greatest prodigal. God has prodigals. Why have they wondered with all these blessings and all all of, of who God is? Yet why do we wonder, Christian? What are why are we we tend to wonder, even as that song says? It breaks us, doesn't it? But let me tell you, He's never left us. We leave him. We leave our first love. There's a whole church in Revelation that God himself, Jesus, speaks of that did just that. Oh, they were busy. Oh, they they were having life groups and they were having potlucks and they were having services and worship services and and they were getting busy in the community and doing all these things. And yeah, they 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 were standing, you know, against those who were teaching false doctrine, but Jesus sees all that and he says, I don't know you. You left, excuse me, yeah, you left your first love. I'm still here. As a matter of fact, I'm knocking at the door trying to get in. Why is it? Lord, help us through this. And he's given us, Christians, something even better than brick and mortar. 
his Holy Spirit, making us now the temple where he dwells in us and he is with us and he does that because he loves us. Well, verse 58, moving on, he continues to say this, that notice that he, God, may incline our hearts to himself. That's interesting. To walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, which he commanded our fathers. Interesting, he says that he may incline. That means to reach out. That means to prick our heart. That means to give us the desire to do his will. I love it. That's the God we serve. No one we're prone to wonder. Knowing we're prone to forget, which we'll celebrate communion. Knowing that we get all caught up in the world, in the world events and things like that. That he pricks our heart. That here, and this is what Solomon is blessing the people and reminding them, that he may incline our hearts to himself. And he does that, but are we listening? Are we responding, maybe is a better word. That he wants us to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments. He's like a shepherd who carries both the staff and the rod. Somebody gave me a book a couple weeks ago that speaks of this shepherd. And the staff, you know, the staff, the crook. And then he also has a rod that he keeps in his belt. Both are to give confidence to the sheep. As the shepherd leads and protects and and nudges them when they need to be a nudge, a prick for their own welfare, for their own welfare. And, And today it stands true for us that God may incline our hearts to himself. That God may prick us and say, Hey, hey, you you you're walking off the the path. Uh, uh, you know, keep Keep my, keep my statutes. Keep my word. Um, again, the Holy Spirit will be for us now the rod and the staff, the umpire of our heart, who speaks to us and convicts us and, and loves us and, and guides us and controls our conscience and controls our heart. He says in 59, and may these words of mine, which I have made supplication, petition, appeal, palms up, remember, before the Lord, be near the Lord our God day and night. I love that. Once again, speaks of his presence, speaks of of a God as Psalm 121.4 says, he who keeps Israel shall never slumber nor sleep. You may try to call that brother or sister who at 4 a.m. or 2.30 a.m. Or, or 12 noon who says, hey, I'm here for you. And you know what? We may be busy. We may not be by the phone, but I'll tell you who's never busy. I'll tell you who never sleeps, and that is God, your Lord. He's, he's, he's ready to hear what you have to say. He's ready to, to hear your prayers. Goes on to say that he may, God, may maintain the cause of his servant. I like this. And the cause of his people Israel as each day may require. The word cause there is a judicial word. It means uh, judgment, justice, and law. Justice, the cause. God is what Solomon is saying is our defense. And he will defend the cause of his servants. And thus far in reading these historical books in the Bible, historical as categorizing them, the the books really starting, um, we could say from Joshua all the way, the the history of Israel, the story of Israel. Actually, it could go all the way back to Genesis, the whole Bible. But anyway, we see how God always was there. As as Israel pleaded their cause, as God's people pleaded their cause before God, God was always there to ensure that they were taken care of, to ensure that justice was was always there for them because he is their defense and he will defend the cause of his servants. Listen, some of you are saying, well, what's going on in this case or what's going on in that case? Or you don't know my life and where was God in my cause? Well, no one gets away. 
No one gets away. You need to know that. And if not here upon the earth, there is a judgment in the other world. Heaven. There is judgment to come when man stands before God himself. You know, it's troubling when we are ripped off and we should pursue our rights as a citizen on earth. But if truth does not prevail, we are reminded of our dual citizenship citizenship in heaven. Our dual citizenship in heaven. No one gets away, guys. The truth will come out. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. No one gets away. And here Solomon is just saying, here is a God that pleads our cause, that, that maintains the cause of his servant, and he does that still today. So as God brings peace, as God keeps his promise, as God will never leave nor forsake, as God inclines the hearts toward him, and, and as God defends Israel, it was all to be a, a testimony to others. Look at verse 60. That all the peoples, and I love this. God is so timely. That all the peoples, that word means nations, tribes, races. Look it up. All the people there. Not just Israel. Of the earth may know that what? The Lord is God and there is no other Solomon is saying, as God is all this to us, guys, we are the light, and a light should not be underneath a table or a bush. We don't hide the light. We are the light on the hill to all nations. God does all of this that we may brag upon him, that we may show others the God, the true God, says here, that the Lord is God and there is no other They were to be missionaries of God's goodness to others. As Guzik would say, the blessing to Israel wasn't meant to end with Israel. God wanted to bless the world through Israel. And that was his his main purpose in speaking to Abram, making him Abraham, the, the, the father of many what? Nations. That's right. And that nations again, ethnos, ethnics, races, people of the earth, all the people, tribes, tongues, nations. So here, here, I love it how Solomon just kind of starting to wrap this up. And he says, all of this is great. And we're blessed people. But it's, as I always tell you, it's, it's nothing that we should keep in. We don't contain it. It's just for ourselves. We got to give it away. We've got to tell others. And this is what he brings to the people here. Verse 61. He says, Let your heart, therefore, be what? Loyal to the Lord. Look at all that God has done for you, he says. Look at all that God has done for us. We're at peace. We're not at war. We've got this wonderful temple. He provided all this. He says, Therefore, be loyal to God, our God, to walk in his statutes and to keep his commandments as at this day. And we are God's bride today, aren't we? We are his bride today. And we are not to have any other besides God. We we are the bride. And Christ is our our, um, groom and uh, our savior. And when Israel wasn't loyal to God, as you know, he called, God called it what? Adultery. Isn't that interesting? He called it adultery. God, God when he looked at Israel, that was, that was his bride, in a sense, in the Old Testament. Those were his people, you know. Uh, and, and, and yet, when they were not loyal, he says, it's adultery. And so too with us, in, in a sense, in 1 Corinthians 6, 15, Paul says, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Everybody go like this. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? No. Certainly not, he says. 
That's a strong word. Then he went on to verse 19 to say this, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is what? In you. Okay? Whom you have from God and you are not your own. You've been purchased, man. And we're going to we're going to remember in a minute how we were purchased and was through the blood of Christ. He says, verse 20, for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Man, you've been stamped. You've been sealed. You are God's, man. That's something good to know as well tonight. But also, are we loyal to Christ? Again, we know we, we're prone to wander, right? Hence, we have the Holy Spirit. We have the rod of the staff. We, we are pricked. We are brought back. We are, uh, are we responding to that, you know, positively, if I could say? Are we responding to that spiritual nudge? Are we responding to the Holy Spirit? Because he's there to help us. It's for our, be- our, our own benefit. And to know that we're bought with a price, we have the Holy Spirit in us. We are God's property. We are not of our own. Well, man, that that, that should just, wow, I'm I'm that special? Yeah, people may have told you throughout your life, you're nothing, you won't succeed to be anything, you're a nobody, you're a throwaway. You know what? Don't believe that. You are somebody. You are God's property if you're a believer today. If you're serving Jesus Christ, you are somebody so special. He loves you so much, man. He died for you. On the third day, he rose again. And if that wasn't enough, in that relationship you have, he comes to live within you, man. Now, that's special. That's great. The key to being loyal and not strained, again, as Solomon says to the people, is to walk in his statutes, and he keeps and keep his commandments, which translates to the Christians, is first to love Jesus with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and then second to love others as yourself i love jesus he he made it simple for us right he just broke it down to two things i i can keep reminding you the vertical and the horizontal love him and love others man we can do that with the power of the holy spirit he gives us his spirit well wrapping this up he says here in 62 he says then the king and all israel with him offered sacrifices before the lord And Solomon offered a sacrifice of peace offerings. Now remember, go back to this chapter. It begins with prayer. It begins with with the blessing. It it begins with dedication. And now comes for them the sacrifice, you see. In that order, and and that's very important because many people were coming to the temple or would come to the temple in in the future their hearts weren't broken. They were just going through it. They were just going through the, the religious uh, um, calisthenics, if you would. And this is the time. It got to the point where by the time Jesus came, it was just, not all of them, but most of them, they were just, because they were like sheep without a what? Without a shepherd. But no, this is a great thing. Now it's time to sacrifice. And now it's time to offer. Notice he says the peace offerings. And I remind you that a peace offering required a portion for the Lord, and then the remainder was given to the priest and the people. It really, respectfully, it was a big barbecue, man. It was a big barbecue. It was a big potluck. It had nothing to do with pot or luck, but it was a big barbecue, man. And then he says, which he offered to the Lord. Now notice this, 22,000 bulls, 120,000 sheep, <laughs> So the king and all the children of Israel dedicated the house of the Lord, verse 64. And on the same day, the king consecrated the middle of the court that was in front of the house of the Lord. For there he offered burnt offerings, grain offerings, and the fat of the peace offering. This was such a, I mean, look at all this meat. Look at all these animals that were going to be offered. There was not enough room in the, the, you know, the, the temple proper to, to do all of this, he, he says, look at, because the bronze altar that was before the Lord was too small, you think? 22,000 bulls? 
to receive the burnt offerings, the grain offerings, and the fat of the peace offering. So he kind of extended the court, if you would, so that they could do some of the, uh, perform some of the, you know, the offerings in that area. So, you know, just moving it out a little bit. And God, God accepted that because he, had, he knew their hearts. And then he holds a feast, 65. And at that time, Solomon held a feast, huh? And all Israel was with him. A great assembly from the entrance of Hamath to the brook of Egypt, which speaks of the uh, geography of Israel. And look it up. You notice it, 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 is, it is expanded of, of the land that was given to Israel. Don't have time to get into it, but you can look it up. He says, before the Lord our God, seven days and seven more days. So 14 days total. It's barbecue, man. It's just fellowship. It's joy. It's excitement. It's celebration. And then he says on the eighth day, that would be the, the eighth day after the second week, which some people, if you're into this, always say that the eighth day is the day of new beginnings. He sent the people away, and they blessed the king, and they went, notice this, to their tents, joyful and glad of heart. Underline that. For all the good that the Lord had done for his servant David and for Israel, his people. I love this. A celebration, the worship. Worship should always lead to a joyful and glad heart. Have you ever come to church service or a service on Wednesday or or even a life group? And, 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 And to be honest, Maybe you, don't, you didn't feel like coming. You just, you know what? I, maybe some of you are like that. You didn't feel like tuning in, you know. But man, after the service, after the worship, after the word of God, it's, man, I'm so glad I came. That happens so many times, doesn't it? Because after the service, after worship, worship should always lead to a joyful and glad heart. Sundays, if we could say, should always lead to a joyful and glad heart as well. We leave full of the manna of his word, joyful of the fellowship that brought us into the presence of the Lord, wherever three or more are gathered. He is present. And a glad heart as we sang and agreed in worship unto our Lord, how good he is. How good. And that's why... It is so important to gather. That's why it's so important, man, to come together and and just to worship and fellowship, get into the word of God, and to leave with joy and to leave with a glad heart. Amen? Well, praise God for that. Read ahead chapter 9 of 1 Kings. But, you know, he, he spoke here of the cause for his people. He spoke here of justice. And I can't think of a better person who knew what it was not to have justice, not to, uh, to, to be uh, taken for granted, to be falsely accused, uh, to be in a mammertime prison, uh, to be awaiting his own death, uh, uh, something that he was, he was uh, um, not guilty of. Um, we know that there in... In 2 Timothy, which was Paul's last letter uh, written, I like to say his, his last will and tes- testament, in 2 Timothy 4, 6, it says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. You know, here's a guy that was falsely accused and about to meet uh, the, uh, the one who was going to take his head off. The, he was, the guillotine was waiting for him. But he says this, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous, the righteous what? The righteous judge. See, he, he didn't get justice here on earth, but he knew justice was waiting for him in heaven. He knew that no one is going to get away. But here he says, man, There is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all 
who have loved his appearing, meaning all who have called upon the name of the Lord as their Savior. He would write this because he had the confidence and the faith. He had the strength of his Savior who was also falsely accused, who was also put on a, a Roman cross. And although it was the plan of his father to give his son for the sins of the world, for the injustice of the world, for all those who in, in the present at that time and in the future, that's speaking of you and me, for all of us who would come before him to seek repentance and salvation. Paul could, Paul could say those things and Paul could walk to that guillotine knowing that he will see his Savior face to face, the, ju- the righteous judge. Nero was not a righteous judge. Festus and all these other, uh, all, they weren't righteous judges, but he knew he was going to be with his Lord, the, the righteous judge, and that he would speak to him as one who was innocent. Innocent, number one, because of what his Savior did on that cross, saved him. And isn't it number two, because he knew I did nothing to deserve this guillotine. Hence, as we look at our, or as we gather, get our elements of communion, we again remind you of Paul's writing. And there in 1 Corinthians 11, you know this, verse 23 For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was what? He was betrayed. You ever been betrayed? He was betrayed. He took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this and remember it of me. Let us remember him. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant, praise God, the covenant of grace in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Let us partake of that. The Lord bless you, keep you, and watch over you this week till we can gather again in this sanctuary on Sunday or online. And we look forward to that. Know that you're loved and cared for. God bless you guys.